Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Thanks for uh, coming tonight on this uh, third session of 13 Letters, a story of Paul's walk and words. And if you're new tonight for the first time, you need to pick up one of these. It has 50 pages in it. If you've been here before, you need to pick up one of these because it has the rest of the 50 pages in it from the first week. So just make sure that you have all 50 pages. I guess that's that's the admonition. There's nothing new tonight that wasn't passed out last week. So um, anyway, that's the logistics involved in that. Uh, let me pray for us, and then we're just going to open this session tonight, okay? Lord, thanks for these gatherings on Wednesday night when we can get together and dive into your word, learn more about you, and especially your servant Paul, who was a faithful servant to the very end, and we'd love to be like him if we could. And uh, we just ask your presence tonight, bless this gathering, give us fresh insights, inspiration, give us hunger if we need it, or strength if we need it, or comfort if we need it. We're gathered together in your name. So bless this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. 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 Okay. Um, this is only a four-week class. We could do it like 20 weeks if you wanted to do 20 weeks, but we only have four weeks, so we're kind of shoehorning things into the schedule that we have to work with, and hopefully it's not too quick. But uh, we're going to start out by turning to the agenda page, page one. Let me just reorient you to where we are. In this uh, four-week class, uh, the week one, we really talked about who Paul was, what his background was, how he got saved, what happened right after that and how, he was, how he, he was prepared for ministry. And that covered about the first 10 pages of your binder, and we talked about that then. Then last week, Paul starts out on his missionary journeys, and we put uh, names to these journeys this time, and the, the first mission is called Unexpected Changes. Why was that? Because there were lots of unexpected changes on that first mission. And then the second mission, we called the spirit takes over why did we say that because the spirit took over <laughs> i know it's, it works that way and so those are the last two weeks and the good thing about these binders is you can take them home and you can keep them forever or not and and you can go over the material and if you happen to be reading any of paul's letters you go back over it and look at your notes so it's a resource so even if we are going quickly it's a resource for you tonight's week three and what is the name of this mission? The teaching tour. And why would that be? Because it's a teaching tour. And we're going to talk about that. And then, find, and then we have another uh, uh, part of tonight's session called Stepping into the Void, which is all about Paul's voyage to Rome. So uh, let's turn to where we're going to start tonight, and that is on page 24. And we're going to go back and forth with this page earmarked four or five or six times tonight. So we're always going to come back to this page. This is our anchor page as we go through this uh, discussion about the teaching tour, the third mission of uh, Paul to Ephesus, Macedonia, and Corinth. Uh, all of these missions that he took, and there's four of them in total, um, were different. And what made them different? Well, they had different destinations, they had different durations, they had different purposes. And um, this tour, as you can see, this beautiful map there drawn out for you, is going to be the longest one. And it's going to take three years at least, maybe more than that. Uh, probably more like four to five years. Like, okay, honey, I'm going on a tour. When are you coming back? Not sure, but it could be like five years. Well. Um, anyway, that was the way it was, and uh, thankfully at that time of, of his life, Paul was probably single. The other thing to, to notice here is there's a key verse that I'm going to read to you. You might want to just jot it down, the name of the verse. It's 2 Corinthians 11:28, And that's going to be the, kind of like the banner verse of the teaching tour. So Paul in 2 Corinthians, which we'll talk about a little bit later tonight, lists out all these different things that have happened to him on his ministry, like shipwrecks and all this stuff. And at the very end of that long list, he says this, and apart from the other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. 
So Paul not only planted all these churches, these, these assemblies all over the place, but he's anxious about them. If you can believe that Paul could get anxious, but he was because he's concerned that they thrive and they grow and that they don't get distracted and that evil people don't come in and destroy them. So that's going to be our key voice, verse. Apart from all these things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the churches. So this is the, uh, this is the third tour. Paul, I want you to see Antioch on the map there. I want you to circle that. Circle Antioch. Antioch has become the home base for Paul's ministry for a number of years. But now when he leaves Antioch, he's never coming back, ever, to Antioch. So this is going to be a movement of the home base from Antioch to Ephesus. It started out in Jerusalem. That was, quote, the mother church, the church in Jerusalem from all where the apostles went out. Then the action actually moved north, and the center of God's work was in Antioch for a number of years. And now the center is going to move again over to Ephesus. So that's going to be uh, happening tonight. And then it's going to move again to Rome after that. That's page 24. I want you to turn, uh, on page 24 uh, in Ephesus, let's talk about that first, the first bullet on the, on, the, on the list. Paul's vision is now going to be enlarged. It's going to include the whole world. It's not just going to be a regional thing. And uh, he leaves Antioch, and he goes north, and he goes through Galatia and Phrygia and ends up in Ephesus. You can read about that in Acts chapter 19. And he's going to park there for three years. He's going to start teaching in the synagogue, and then he's going to teach in a school, but he's going to be there for three years. That's why we call it the teaching tour, because he's establishing the church in this large metropolitan city that we know of as Ephesus. Acts 19.10 says, as a result of this, the whole population of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Like, it just went out. It was clear that, that, that this was happening um, during those three years that he was there. During this time that he was in Ephesus, he's going to write Galatians and 1 Corinthians during that three-year period of time. We don't know exactly what part of that time, but, but uh, he hears that there's trouble in River City. Galatians, somebody from Galatia comes over and says, Paul, we've got a mess going on. You've got to help us. And these, remember, I think we talked about these people called the Judaizers. You remember who they are? They're Jewish Christians, so they're believers, if you can believe that. But these believers believe that you have to be Jewish before you can become a Christian. And try as they may, none of the apostles can convince them otherwise. They're just going to say, they're going to blow off the elders, blow off James and Peter and all those guys. They say, no, we're not budging. So they cause trouble. And they're going to cause Paul a lot of trouble. They're in Galatia. They're going, to, they're going to try to attack his teaching, his leadership, his moral character, and they're going to try them to win them over. And so that, that's why Paul is going to write Galatians. Let's skip over 25 and go to page 26 right now. To understand Galatians, you have to understand the Gauls. Who were the Gauls? The Gauls were warring tribes in France, of all places, and they migrated down to Turkey, which is Asia Minor, and they parked in this place called Galatia, and they were the Galatians. And they said, Gali, and, and they were just totally fickle people. And they were that way because they were warring people, and they never knew when they were going to be attacked from behind. So they're always looking over their shoulder, and they, they flip-flopped, they were easily distracted, they're easily... O um, overcome by people, they're anxious all the time, they don't listen, they're just kind of on edgy people. And so Paul writes this letter to them, telling them to step back from the edge, but what is the theme of this letter? What does it say on page 20, 26? Run hard from bad religion. How about that for a theme of a Bible book? Run hard from bad religion. I didn't say run fast, I said run hard. What does it mean to run hard? Get out of there. Don't put up with them. Don't, put up with them. don't even debate with them. Don't sit and talk with, a, with them as they knock on your door. Get out. Just run away as fast as you can. 
from bad religion. And what was the bad religion? It was the Judaizers that were adding the complexity of Judaism to Christianity, and you should run away from that. Don't even debate with them. They're not, you're not going to win them over. This is their ideology. So just run hard from bad religion. Um, written about in 55 AD from Ephesus, as we said. Let me read you the, the back story of this, of this letter. Jewish believers were the first Christian converts. When they heard the good news of the gospel, many Jews abandoned their former religion and became disciples of Christ. Yet, because of their strong cultural roots, the early Christian churches had a Jewish flavor. That is, until Christianity began to spread into the larger Greek world. Galatia was a Roman province in Asia Minor, today's Turkey. It was located in a region not terribly far from the, the uh, city of Antioch, Paul's home base. When he decided to travel west to spread the message of the gospel, Paul passed through Galatia first. There he planted churches and in many cities of the province. And though non-Jewish Christians filled the congregations, these churches also attracted many Jew converted Jews. This mixture of Jews and Gentiles created the potential for cultural conflicts, especially among groups of newer converts. One such issue erupted when a group of legalistic Jewish Christians began to force their belief that people must become Jewish first before becoming Christians. This greatly confused the believers. When Paul heard this, he went ballistic, which he probably didn't know that word back in AD 55, but he went ballistic. He quickly composed this sternly worded letter to openly debunk the false teaching. No, you don't need to become Jewish first. And he sent it to the churches in Galatia to be read out loud in their meetings. In this letter, Paul used strong language to help the Galatians return their, to their freedom that they had experienced in Christ. So Christ has set us free. Why should we be entangled again in the yoke of bondage? Don't do that. Don't do circumcision. Don't keep the holy days. If you want to do holy days, up to you. But it's not legally required of you to do that. Okay? Let me just pass on this one definition. Some of you have heard this before. I think it's a really good one. What is religion? What is the definition of religion? Faith. Faith could be a word. The practices or, or beliefs of a certain community. I think that's a good one, too. Here's what I think religion is. Religion is man's attempt to please God without Christ. Any so are we in a religion? No. Technically, we are not in a religion. We are in a relationship. Christianity is labeled a religion by people who don't know what it is. But we don't, we, don't, we don't do religious practices for the sake of religious practices. It's all about we have a living God, we have faith in Christ, and we want to follow him. How do we do that? So religion is man's attempt to please God without Christ. I just love that. So think about any other religion out there. That's really what's going on with those religions. But we're in a relationship. Page 27. you got to love page 27. Les Miserables. Yeah, many of us have seen that play. Yeah, three or four or five times, I'm sure. Yeah, the interesting thing about, about this is just one of the, the inter interesting factoids. Uh, Galatians is like the French Revolution because they both have the same three watchwords. The watchwords of the French Revolution were liberty, equality, and fraternity. When uh, they were trying to throw off the, uh, the oppression from above, they said, we must have liberty. We must be free as citizens of France. And we all need equal rights. There shouldn't be two different classes of people. And we must stand together for this noble cause. So that was, those were the watchwords of the French Revolution. And these are the same three watchwords that you're going to find in Galatians. So these, these Judaizers had come in, and now uh, they need to throw off uh, them. So Christ has truly set us free. That's liberty. In Christ, there's neither slave nor free, male nor female. We are all equal in Christ's sight. And uh, you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's the fraternity that we experience. So that's the, the, that is kind of the background of Galatians and why he wrote that letter.
page 28. We're, we're jumping all over the place. So go to page 28. 28 is 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is, is another letter, the second letter that Paul wrote during the teaching tour. And um, probably around 57 AD, again from Ephesus, he's there for three years on his third mission. What is the theme of 1 Corinthians? 11 migraines. What's a migraine? bad headache. What is 11 migraines? A very bad headache. So somebody has 11 migraines. It's either the church in Corinth or the Apostle Paul or both. What do you think? Yeah, it's going to be probably both. 11 migraines. That's so visual. Let me read you why the letter was written. Paul had established the church in Corinth around 54 AD during his second missionary journey. Paul was both a large metropolis and a major trading center for that part of the world. But the city had a terrible reputation for being an especially immoral place. For this reason, in the three years since Paul had last visited Corinth, the poisons of idolatry, immorality, and intellectualism had begun to seep into the church. These issues came to Paul's attention in two ways during the time he was in Ephesus ministering to the church there. First, when a family from the church in Ephesus returned from a trip to Corinth, they brought back a troubling report. There's trouble going on over there, Paul. Then a delegation from the church in Corinth arrived in Ephesus with a laundry list of serious issues to discuss with Paul. Since Paul was unable to travel to Corinth to deal with these issues, he wrote this comprehensive letter to the church there, sequentially calling out 11 major problems and providing corrective action for each of them. He strongly encouraged the believers to turn away from wrong or immoral practices and to rid their church of outside influences, hoping that they would both listen to him and change their ways. As we'll find out in 2 Corinthians, they did. Good for you, church in Corinth. Good for you. Yeah, and, and 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I plead with you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. So that's the, the lead. I think that would be the key verse. On page 29, you have a list of the 11 migraines. And they're going to come from two major sources. First, the rampant and unchecked immorality that we just spoke of. And then the arrogance of the local intellectuals. The, real, the uppity snobby people who think they know everything. Why is that a problem? Why would that be a problem in a church? Yeah, it would. Well, these are not nine-year-olds, so these are adults who think they know everything. Is it is it good or bad to have an opinionated person in a church? Yeah, not so good. Yeah, we have to all kind of park that at the front door. Eleven migraines. Number one, factions, parties, and divisions. Paul's going to spend four chapters on that one. We're going to come back to that in a second. Number two, a church scandal. There's incest going on somewhere. Number three, lawsuits, suing each other in church, general immorality, marriage issues, eating meat sacrificed to idols, which was a pagan thing, women's roles in worship. That became an issue in that church. Worship behavioral issues. There were other things that, were, that they dealt with. Um, the best way to use spiritual gifts. And then the last two, are more about the need for more adequate understanding than correcting something that's immoral. So I think like the first eight or nine is about inappropriate behaviors, and the last two is about inadequate knowledge. All right, inadequate knowledge about resurrection, inadequate knowledge about Christian giving. So Paul is going to spend time talking about those two things. So, and he's dealing with them one at a time. Do you like that? I love that. He's so sequential. 
He's listing them one at a time, and he's going right straight through the book from chapter 1 through chapter 16. But he spends four chapters um, on this idea of factions, parties, and divisions. Should there be a division in the church for any reason? Never. We should all be one in Christ. Opinions cause division or preferences cause division. And this church was full of them. I am of Apollos, I am of Paul, I'm of Peter. I mean, they, they, just had, they were starting to make little groups. And so Paul's going to nip this in the bud. Why is that? Why, is, why does he lead with this one? It's the most important, that's, that's right, it's the most important issue, and it's going to spend four chapters. It could actually kill the church, it could fracture. You know, instead of the church at Cyprus Church, we could have Cyprus Church number one, two, three, four, because we all have differences, but we are one body in Christ. So that is 1 Corinthians 11 migraines. So tomorrow you're in Safeway, someone says, hey, what's 1 Corinthians about? You say, oh, that's easy, we learned that last night. It's about 11 migraines. <laughs> Just, you got it. Okay, now turn back to page 24. We're going to be turning back to this page a lot. You might want to stick your finger in there or a paper clip or something. Okay, so page 24. So that was in Ephesus. Now we're going to get down to in Macedonia. So do you see Ephesus on the map there? Do you see Macedonia is north of that? It's a province in Greece. Um, Paul, after he spends three years in, um, in Ephesus, he feels like his mission is over, like this chapter is coming to an end. In Acts 19, 20 through 22, it says this, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. This is the end of his three years. And he said, you know what? I think I need to move on. The Lord's done a lot here in three years. I need to move on. And he says this. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So Paul started in Jerusalem. <clears throat> he went to the next major capital, Antioch. Now he's to the next major capital, Ephesus, and now where's his brain going? Rome, which is the capital of all capitals at that time. He's going to the mother, uh, the mother city of that Roman Empire. After I go to Macedonia and Achaia and Jerusalem, I'm going to go to Rome. That's what he, he purposes in the spirit to do that. So he goes north uh, to Macedonia. He meets Titus there. He had sent Titus from um, Ephesus to go to Corinth and check out what was happening. Let me give you another factoid. I mean, these are free. Do you know that the word Titus is not mentioned in the book of Acts at all? Timothy is mentioned countless times, but Titus was never mentioned. Well, he was an apprentice too. He was a young worker too. He's mentioned in a lot of Paul's letters. You know, why wasn't he mentioned at all? Well, we don't know for sure. We're gonna have to ask Titus when we get there. Why, why, did, why did Luke not mention you? The speculation was that Titus is Luke's brother. And he didn't want to write him in his book of Acts because that would look like it was family business. So he left the word Titus out. I don't know if that's true or not. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter. But Titus is not mentioned in the book of, of Acts. But Paul says in Corinthians, I sent Titus to Corinth. I'm, I'm sending him to you to help out there. So then Titus is coming back around the horn. You see where Corinth is. He's going to meet up with Paul in Macedonia. And you say, how did they ever meet? Like they didn't have text messages. They didn't have phones. <clears throat> how could they actually do that? <clears throat> and the answer was that they probably sent letters. The Romans had a great postal system, and they probably sent a letter saying, I'll meet you there sometime. I'll hang out. So they met up there. Paul is going to, um, Titus is going to br bring back a good report that, hey, the Corinthians got your last letter and they're really shaping up. So uh, he's going to write 2 Corinthians from Macedonia and send that letter to Corinth before he actually goes there himself. So he's going to write <clears throat> 2 Corinthians there. Let's turn now to page 30.
2 Corinthians. 58 AD, possibly from Macedonia in Greece. And what is the theme of 2 Corinthians? Hit me with your best shot. What does that mean to you? What is he saying? He's saying, let's do this. You're, you want to pick a fight with me? You, are you trying to pick a fight with me? We're going to do this. You and me. We're going to go out in the back. You and me. So that's, that's exactly what the letter is. Paul is daring a small group of rebels in the church in Corinth to a showdown. And the letter is going to be the showdown. And here's the verse, 2 Corinthians 11, 5. I don't consider myself inferior in any way to these super apostles, so-called super apostles. So here's the, here's the story. Paul was not one to brag, at least not now. For from the time that Jesus had knocked him down on the road to Damascus, almost 20 years earlier... Paul had become a humble servant of Christ, so deeply grateful to Jesus for rescuing him from his former life. But this was different. Paul had heard from his co-worker Titus that the church in Corinth had responded well to his earlier letter. Many of the believers had turned away from all the outside evil influences that had crept into the church. But another problem had arisen. A small faction of rebellious Christians was now trying to discredit Paul and his apostleship by spreading bold-faced lies about him. So Paul was forced to take the offensive and did so by writing this strong letter to the believers. In it, he both encouraged the faithful majority and shut the mouths of the dissenting few. His approach with the rebels was to humbly but confidently boast of his many and varied experiences of Christ, in essence saying to them, bring it. And then closely followed by, is that all you got? Like, so they're, they're going to have this showdown, and he's asking them to bring their goods, and they're not going to have anything to bring. So that's kind of the story. You can read in 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 12. Just write that down, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I guess it's actually the, the, the end of chapter 11 into chapter 12. Paul is listing a lot of the things that he had as experiences of Christ. And then in chapter 12, he throws down the, uh, <clears throat> the wild card. Okay, here's what he says. This is, let me read this to you. 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 5. Okay, I just told you about all the things that the Lord took me through. How about this one? I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether he was in the body or out of his body, I don't know, God knows. And I know this man who was caught up to paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, that is not permissible for man to utter, and on behalf of this man, I will boast. He never uses his name, but he says, I know somebody who went to heaven. Okay, you rebels, have you gone to heaven? <laughs> never, never. So this is going to be shut the mouth time. Yeah. So Paul, apparently, if you believe Paul, had an all-expense-paid trip to heaven. 14 years prior to this, which would have been at the time when he was just saved, certainly right after he was saved, he was in Tarsus, and the Lord gave him a vision or took him there and showed him things. And then he says, um, to make sure that I didn't say anything, God gave me a thorn in the flesh. And that's right after that time. And then he asked the Lord to, to remove it. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. So he had some kind of a, an issue after that. We don't know exactly what it was. But anyway, hit me with your best shot. And this is what this is all about. Yeah, Page. Yes, if you just keep reading that. Yes, exactly. Page 31. Okay, probably never heard this before. 2 Corinthians is actually 4 Corinthians. All right. 
Any questions? <laughs> yeah. So Paul, in his letters in 1 Corinthians and in 2 Corinthians, talks about other letters he wrote to them. And he talks about other visits. So scholars, as they're pouring through this material, have kind of laid this out. And you see at the top there that you had three visits. The first was in, for 18 months, followed by two later visits that he made to the, to the church there. And in between that, he wrote letters. The first one was called the previous letter. We don't have it. We, it's not in our Bible. It's a letter he wrote. We do not have it. And then the second letter he wrote is 1 Corinthians. The third letter he wrote is called his sorrowful letter. We don't, letter. We don't have that one either. And then the fourth one is 1, 2 Corinthians. So if someone asks you, hey, how many letters did Paul write to Corinth? You have to clarify the question. Do you mean in our New Testament or do you mean in total? Because he could have written more than four. Yeah. So anyway, 2 Corinthians in your Bible is actually the fourth letter that he wrote. So let me ask you this question. Does this bother you that we don't have two of the letters? Because we don't know what we're missing, that's a good answer. And why don't we have them? Did someone misplace them? Did they get burned up? All we can say is that God did not see fit to give us those letters in the New Testament. We believe the New Testament is complete in and of itself. And whatever uh, letters that Paul wrote, Paul wrote, probably wrote many, many other letters to many other places that were not deemed to be um, sacred writings. For whatever reason, we don't know the answer to that question. So anyway, this is an interesting factoid for you. 2 Corinthians is actually 4 Corinthians. So now I want you to turn back to our favorite page, page 24. And now Paul's going to move on. He's going to actually go to Corinth. So at the bottom of page 24 in Corinth, he's going to go there and he's going to stay three months which is not a short stay, three months in Corinth. And while he's there for his three months, he's going to write the letter to the Romans. We don't exactly know what prompted it because it's not, uh, it's not told us exactly in Scripture. So there's a lot of speculation. Well, why did he write it then and so on? Apparently, he was either thinking of Rome or had heard that there was a church meeting in Rome, felt compelled to write it. Something happened. But we do know that he wrote the letter to the Romans while he was in Corinth. Okay, so now I want you to turn to page 32. This is a page-turning night. So turn to page 32. Here's the question, and you won't know this answer necessarily, but I'm going to throw it anyway. How do we know that Paul wrote Romans from Corinth? And the answer is that in chapter 16, near the very end of the letter, he says, I'm sending this letter to you from Sister Phoebe of the church in Sancria. Well, the church in Sancria was a neighbor church of Corinth. It was at the seaport. And so Phoebe was heading to Rome, and Paul says, here, take this letter with you when you go to Rome and deliver it to the church there. So he tells us in Romans 16 that Phoebe is going to bring it, and welcome her when she brings you the letter, but she's a local girl. So that's how you know that it was written in Corinth. Do you like Romans? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it difficult? No. Yes. Why is it difficult? It's hard, topics. hard topics. That's a good answer. Difficult theology. A lot of detail. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's just hard to understand that. Completely saved is the, is the theme that I picked. Completely saved. What would that mean, completely saved? Well, it means that the salvation that we have in Christ is more than we think, we think it is. It is rich. It is, it is robust. It is full. And uh, 1 Thessalonians tells us that we have three parts of our being. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Our body is physical. Our soul is psychological. Our spirit is spiritual. Our body has five senses that we can navigate the world. We can play golf. We can go to concerts. We can eat food. You know, we can do that with our physical body. But our soul is ourself. So if my physical body did not work anymore, 
let's say, God forbid, I was only able just to talk and nothing could move, I would still be here because me, my personality is in my soul. It's my mind, it's my emotion, it's my will. It's all of who I am. My personality is still here, even though my body may not be perfect. So you're saved body, soul, and spirit, as first, what 1 Thessalonians 5 tells us. So the spirit is the spiritual part of our being. Our human spirit is the container for the Holy Spirit. Just think of it that way. So when you are born of the spirit, you, you receive the spirit into your being, it takes residence. He takes residence in your human spirit, which is the deepest part of your being. So salvation can be all of those parts. You are regenerated when the life of God comes into you, into your spirit, and your spirit is made alive. That's one salvation. Number two, you're transformed in your soul when he takes over your mind and your feelings and your decisions. That's another aspect of God's complete salvation. And then one day we're going to be transfigured in our bodies. Not that we need, you know, we do need better bodies because we're falling apart, unfortunately. So, yeah, like it's going to be the 20 Eric or the 25 or the 30 year old. I don't know what it's going to look like, but we're going to get new bodies. We're going to, this is going to be a used car at some point. We're going to get rid of the junker. We're going to be transfigured, the Bible tells us. So saved in our body, saved in our soul, saved in our spirit, completely saved. How about that? What is the difference between the soul and the spirit? The spirit is spiritual. The soul is psychological. Your soul is your mind, your soul is your emotions, your feelings, and your, and your soul is your, your will, which is your decisive mm -hmm. capability. But everybody has that, and everybody has a human spirit. Most of the people are walking around with an empty human spirit. They don't have the treasure in their earthen vessel. They have not yet allowed the Spirit of God to come into them by saying, Lord Jesus, I, I believe in you. So that's the difference. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit, our human spirit. So we're made alive in our spirit. Very good question. Thank you for that. Yeah, there is a difference. Hebrews tells that there are two parts, that the word of God is living and operative and sharper than any two-edged sword and can divide soul from spirit. Two parts. Interesting. Really interesting there. So, yeah. So I have this. I guess I can go here. So I have, here's an illustration. So I love golf, right? I just love golf. So let's say I walk into a golf store, and there's a set of new clubs there. And I need new clubs. You never know how I need these new clubs. <laughs> and they're on sale, for Pete's sake. And I say to myself, oh, I think, I think, I use my mind, I think I want these. Yes, they're only $19.95 plus tax. Uh, yeah, I, can, I can figure it out. Bonnie will never know. We just do it off record. You never know I'm spending two grand on these clubs. Oh, yes. I, so I convince my mind. And then my emotions just love them. So there's the a love part. And then I make the decision I'm going to buy them. So body is mind, emotion, will. All of it is in agreement until I go to the cash register. And then the Lord says, put them back. <laughs> so that's the human spirit for you. Anyway. <laughs> Romans. Romans. Did I read this? Did I read your Romans story? Paul was an expert at planting and growing churches. Wherever he went, he preached the good news of Christ's salvation and in so doing scattered spiritual seeds in the communities he visited. Many of these gospel seeds found good soil in the seeking hearts of local residents and began to take root. Before long, significant numbers of people became newborn followers of Christ and a church spontaneously formed. Most often, Paul would remain in that place for a few weeks, teaching and preaching, until the faith that, had form, that was forming in the new believers became firmly rooted. Then he would move on to the next location. But Rome was different. Paul had never been there. The church in that city had been started in some other way. So when Paul heard that there were Christians meeting together in Rome, he felt compelled, compelled to help that church grow too. The way to do that would be to pass along to them the truths of salvation that he had taught the believers in other places to give them a comprehensive picture of God's purpose for their lives. Since Paul was in Corinth at the time and couldn't travel to Rome, he decided to do the next best thing, which to, was to write them a letter, a long, detailed letter 
filled to the brim with deep truth and foundational teachings about the Christian faith. So that's kind of the background of Romans. All right. On page 33, I give you just one illustration of one aspect of Romans, and that is many of you who were here a few years ago when we went through Romans, you know, we went through it. It took us a year to go through Romans, just like uh, Ben's going through Revelation right now. And we, we took a different perspective, and we took, we took the perspective that Romans is about oneness. And there's, there was these two groups of people in Rome, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, the non-Jewish Christians who were, who were potentially fighting uh, there. And so Romans 14 and 15 is about oneness. And maybe, maybe that is uh, something that we should also think about in, in, in terms of being completely saved, um, being reconciled with people who don't really get along or don't come from the same background that we come from. So let me just leave that for the sake of time, that there is this aspect of Romans that has reconciliation written all over it. Okay, at this point, we're about ready to leave. Um, so you can go to page 25 now. And actually, since 20, isn't 25 right across from 24? Yeah. So um, on page 24, you, Paul is going to leave Corinth. He's going to go up north through Macedonia, down through Ephesus, and he's going to take a ship over to Jerusalem. Do you see that on the map? He was going to take a ship directly across from Corinth to Ephesus, but there was a plot to kill him. And he found out about this plot, and he said, I better not do that. <laughs> Good idea. So he went on land instead, and then from Ephesus, he goes to Jerusalem. So on page 25, he lands in Jerusalem. They go up, and, and Luke is with him, because Luke is writing all this stuff firsthand. They go visit the church in Jerusalem. Paul visits the temple. And during the time that Paul's visiting the temple, a riot breaks out. They want, and this is the Jews. The jealous Jews know that Paul's in town. He has been messing with Gentiles. He's been associating with Gentiles. And they are unclean, so we're not having that. And they try to kill him. And in the middle of this melee, fortunately, this Roman centurion grabs Paul by the neck and pulls him up the stairs before he's torn to pieces, and that becomes um, the first step of a number of imprisonments for Paul. So the Romans um, give him refuge. Uh, well, I'll just mention this, this uh, in passing here. So Paul's going to give his testimony about his conversion two more times. He already gave it once in chapter 9. Luke talked about his conversion. Now Paul's going to give it again in chapter 22. He's going to be standing on the stairs in front of the Jewish, Jewish people who want to kill me. He's going to say, just a second before you kill me, I want to tell you my testimony. I was on my way to Damascus, minding my own business, I'm a good Jew, and I met Jesus. And then he's going to go into that, trying to convince them until he talks about the fact that he's turned to the Gentiles, and then they all go ballistic. So that, that was one testimony he gives. And then he's going to be taken up to Caesarea. You see that on the map there? which is a seaport. I couldn't actually draw it on the coast. But there's a fortress there, and that's where the Romans are going to keep him for two years. It's kind of a house arrest. It's not serious like a dungeon thing. His family can visit or whatever, and they can bring food to him. And we think that that's probably during that two years that, Paul, that Luke did his research for his gospel. Like He's, he's there with, with uh, Paul, and Paul says, why don't you go down to Jerusalem and do some research? And so Paul, Luke says, good. So he sets, sets up a meeting with Mary, and he's taking notes and this whole thing. I could see Luke doing that for two years. All right. But he gives a testimony again in chapter 26, this time to King Agrippa. King Agrippa, you never guess what happened to me. I'm on my way to Damascus. Gives the same testimony again. So we have three testimonies of Luke, of, of Paul, about his um, salvation experience. Now... Jump to page 34. We're getting there. This is Paul's voyage. If you've never read Acts 27, you have missed out on life. This is a wonderful sea story. 
It's a story about shipwreck. It's a story about a hurricane. It's a story about Paul taking over leadership. It's fantastic. It will only take you 10 minutes to read it tonight before you go to sleep. In Acts 27, Paul continues his ministry, and now he's going to be stepping into the void. There's going to be a number of voids that present themselves. The first is at a place called Fair Havens. You can see that listed there, and that's actually on that little island. I forgot to label it, but that's Crete. C-R-E-T-E. It's a mountainous island on the island of Crete. So they sail. They, they leave. Here's what Acts 27 1 says. When it was decided that we, Luke is saying we, so is he going? Luke is saying we, is he going on the, yeah, he's going on the ship with Paul. When it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some of the other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. So now Paul plus other prisoners and Luke and maybe others are on this ship and they start heading and they get to Fair Havens uh, on the south part of the island of Crete. The, the shipping lanes closed in the winter. The weather was terrible. So no one that had the least bit of wisdom sailed after November 1st through like January. This just did not. <laughs> so they get there about that time of the year and Paul walks up to the ship captain and says, excuse me, just for one second, could I say something? He says, sure. Paul says, if you sail, I perceive there's going to be damage to this ship and we're going to lose a lot of life. So if I were you, I'd winter here for three or four months and let's do it in the spring. And the captain says, thank you very much for that. And he totally ignores Paul. <laughs> so they set sail. So, the, so besides Fairhaven, I wrote this down, wisdom. You might want to write that word. Paul steps in the gap with God-given wisdom. He's ignored, but he gives wisdom. So they, they end up sailing out uh, to sea. And then, surprise of surprise, they get a storm at sea. It is a hurricane. A ferocious storm hits them. Eventually, all hope is lost. They haven't seen the sun in like days. It's pouring rain. No one is eating food. They can't keep it down. The, the, the ship is, is, is doomed. Paul steps up and he says, I told you so. I just want to go on the record, I told you so. And then he takes over. He's the leader. He takes over the lead of the ship, starts ordering people around. And he says, no harm is going to come to this ship. The Lord visited me last night and said, we're good. We're going to be good to go. Just listen. So that's the, the so the by the storm of sea, I, I wrote the word leadership. God given leadership. God given wisdom. God given leadership. And then finally, over in this island of Malta, at the uh, end of chapter 27, they run the ship aground. The ship breaks apart. Everybody scrambles, gets on shore. No one is lost. 276. Everyone is accounted for. And, and then, not only that, but um, they meet some people on the island, some islanders, and the, the, the leader of the islanders' dad, I think, is sick. And so Paul goes in and prays for him and heals him. And then the whole island comes to him and says, well, if you can heal that guy, you can heal me too. And he heals everybody in the island. So I wrote the word compassion on Malta. So wisdom Leadership, compassion, stepping into the void. And we do this too. We have God-given wisdom. We have God-given leadership. We have God-given compassion. And we can step in the void of somebody else's life and bring what God has given to us to their hurting situations there. So that's the, that's the stepping into the void of the, of the um, voyage to Rome. And then finally, on page 35, and this is our last page for tonight. Boy, this has gone fast. Paul's first Roman imprisonment. He's going to be put under house arrest for two years. He's already been under house arrest for two years in Caesarea, and now this ship, this voyage, and now he's going to be in house arrest for another two years. So is this going to be a good circumstance for Paul or a not so good circumstance for Paul? It's 
a good circumstance, and why would that be? Yes. And the whole, the whole quick, um, group, the yeah, call. Praetorian Guard, yes. Was, was murdered. Yes. So the answer is, for those of you who couldn't hear the answer, that it's a good experience because he got a chance to witness to everybody. As a matter of fact, he witnesses to the Praetorian Guard, which is Caesar's guard, who were probably chained to him. He says, hey, do you know Jesus? <laughs> I mean, every day, every four hours, he's got a new victim. And so he witnesses the people. And then members of Caesar's household get saved. Yeah. And so they're probably having a Bible study in <laughs> Caesar's palace. Like, think about that. It could be Nero at the time, too. Like, what? Good reminder about that. The other thing that's going to happen is he, Paul's going to have time to pray, to think, to be inspired, and to write four of the most profound letters in the New Testament. Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon. We're going to talk about those next week. So during that, those two years, he's going to write those letters that we have. And here's how Acts 28 ends. Luke says this, And so we came to Rome. The brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. He lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And with that sentence... The curtain comes down on the book of Acts. Paul's sitting there in house arrest. We don't know what happened after that. We don't know if, it's, if, it's, if he went on trial, if he was let go. We don't know. So there's a question out there. Well, why did Luke end that way? Luke wrote the book. No, Luke, look, yeah, Luke, yeah, Luke, what are you thinking? Why don't you tell us why you ended it that way? And maybe it was because... The whole purpose was to get Paul to Rome, the center of the world, and once that was accomplished, we are done. I don't know. We're going to have to go to the Luke table. Say, Luke, what were you thinking? Were you going to write the third book? I mean, you did, you did the Gospel of Luke. You did the Acts. And were you going to write the third book and you didn't have time? I don't know. But for whatever reason, the curtain comes down on uh, uh, the book of Acts at the end of this. What we're going to find out, hold on just one second. What we're going to find out next week is we're going to go through the four letters he wrote in, in Rome, and then we're going to read 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy, which he probably wrote after he got out of Rome. There are things in those letters that suggest that he was out again, out and about traveling. So we're going to come to all those next week. Ginger. I don't know. Do you know? Don? Yeah, but, but he probably wasn't working then. And the fact that he had the funds yeah. to pay for food and for people. For two years, it. yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so for those of you who didn't hear it, maybe he was there being protected by the Romans from the Judaizers and from the Jews who wanted to tear him to pieces for those two years. It was probably, it was, it was definitely God's sovereignty that arranged it that way. I mean, wouldn't you like to get away for a couple of years from the, the hectic life that you're... Yeah, just sit on the beach or wherever you are. <laughs> yeah, or something, exactly. So, yeah, other questions? Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, and Philippians. 
Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, and Philippians, possibly in that order. Colossians first, Ephesians second. We'll have it again. I mean, it's in your book. So starting, we're going to start with page 36 um, next week and try to get through all of the other letters. Is this helpful? Yes. Building the context. So the, uh, the whole purpose of this is build context so that then when you start reading it, you can have um, the, the, some of the issues that you're fighting won't be issues anymore. All right, next week. The last of the four sessions. See you then. Oh, study hard. So if you want homework, no. But if you, if you wanted homework, you could go and read pages 24 through 35 again. Just, just do it. Just read them again before you move on. All right. See you next Wednesday.